Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What's going on, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to talk about in the land of movies, TV, comics, and more. You are tuned into the entertainment edition of the ODPH, and we definitely want to interact with you after the show. So, Pad, where should everybody head on over to? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. You swing on over to the website. You check out the social media links. You join in on all the conversations going on there. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, you name it, we're there. You can also check out the T Public store where you never know when a good sale is going to pop up because it always happens every so often. And that is the best time to go get some ODPH swag. I sincerely say that. You can also check out the Patreon link and definitely join that one tier, $2 a month, and you get a lot of content on the way. Got Fear the Walking Dead to talk about with the patrons this month. So you definitely want to sign up for that. And hear my thoughts about the final season of the flagship franchise of The Walking Dead. Also, at the website, you can check out the blog section, which we have a lot of stuff coming out for New Comic Book Day. You can check out the directory, which, Pat, how many providers are we on? Uh, 670,000. Sounds about right to me. I don't question it too much. You can you can check out the classified section, which has friends of the show, such as 3FN Podcast, Dragon Master Games, and so many more. The music section, where you can check out everything going on with Brian Wolf and the Howlers. Second Suitor, Shout at the Robots, Tom Jolu, Floodlands, and the list goes on and on. Basically, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. And remember on social media to use the hashtag ODPHpod. Kicking off the entertainment edition of the show, there's no way around it. There's one movie out at the box office that is dominating pop culture, and rightfully so. Mm Mm-hmm. And that is the latest animated film from Marvel Studios and Mm -hmm. Sony Pictures, I should say, rather. Yeah. Because I'm so used to saying Marvel Studios when we talk Marvel Cinematic. Yep. But this is actually Sony Pictures. Yeah. And this is the sequel to one of the best animated films I've ever seen. An uh, Academy Award winning animated film. Yes. And the sequel did not falter about winning fans over opening weekend. And we are going to be talking about... The one and only Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Now, Pad, you got the box office numbers? I do. So, of course, uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse was number one at the box office, raking in domestically uh, $120,663,589, beating out the likes of The Little Mermaid at number two, The Boogeyman at number three, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume uh, 3 at number four, and then Fast X at number five. Uh, And then for total, uh, as of this recording, uh, domestically they have brought in $133,678,128 dollars internationally they have brought in 87 million nine hundred and one thousand dollars in 223 uh and then for a worldwide total of 221 million five hundred and seventy nine thousand three hundred and fifty one dollars uh and then over on rotten tomatoes with uh 398 critics reviews in it is sitting at 97 percent on the tomato meter and then for an audience score with over 10,000 plus ratings it is sitting at 94 percent so i guess you can say People really liked the sequel to the 2018 film Into the Spider-Verse, huh? Um, I mean, unless the laws of like how percentages work have changed in the last 24 hours, uh, yeah, I'd say so. And we definitely have a lot to talk about that film. So we are going to be kicking off this edition, breaking down across the Spider-Verse. So if you're new to the ODPH, first and foremost, thank you for checking us out. We really do appreciate it. What we'd like to do is give a spoiler-free statement about what we're going to be talking about so we don't ruin anything for you. So if you haven't seen the film yet, Don't worry, we're going to give you a countdown and let you jump out of this episode where you need to. And then after you've seen it, you can pop right back in because Pat does put the spoiler talk stamp in the liner notes of this podcast. So if you've seen the movie already, we're going to have a lot to talk about after the countdown. If you haven't, you know what to do by now. But Pat, let's get into the spoiler-free statement about Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. Admittedly, I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Life uh, found a way, and I've been busy. But from what I've seen, what I've heard, it it sounds like everyone's enjoying it. It sounds really good. Yes, Pat has given me permission to talk about this. Yeah. 
I did go opening night with 3FN, and I will tell you what. I was absolutely impressed with what I saw. When you hear about movies like this with so much hype behind it, you almost had a bar too high, and they can't reach it. And the one thing this film does is it takes so much creativity Mm -hmm. to what you consider for the animated films and really amplifies it and goes into the strong suits. And it reminds everybody about why Spider-Man connects with so many people. Mm -hmm. That he's not Superman. He's not Batman. He is just somebody that just embodies the spirit of doing good and with great power comes great responsibility. And you see this translate through many different forms of Mm Spider-Man throughout this film because where they deep dive into, which is no secret, you really see a wide variety of Mm Spider-People throughout the multiverse. And I love the collection that they presented for this film. I thought this had so many different interpretations of Spider-Man. I thought it really just connected on that level with an amazing story behind it. Setting up for the ultimate end of the franchise for now, dot, 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 with another film coming in a couple of years. Uh, next year. Is next year already? It's coming out next year. Oh, that's good. Even better. I was hearing original rumors of 2025. No, last I'd read was it was coming out in uh, some point next year. Even better for Beyond the Spider-Verse. But in the meantime, though, you will definitely be blown away by the voice acting of Shamik Moore, Haley Steinfeld, Oscar Isaac really, really step things up for their characters respectively and just gives you such a fantastic story to go on and just really captures everything you love about Spider-Man. Uh, according to the IMDb page, it is expected to release in March. Yes. I was worried. I was legitimately worried when I first read it. It was 2025. But there's so many other movies coming out, and especially when you talk time travel, you always get a little worried. I mean, mm-hmm. we have The Flash coming out in a couple of weeks. That's time travel. Well, especially with this movie, it took like four years to make this movie, and I know the, the Spider-Punk uh, animation is one that got talked about in the last week or so that like the spider punk animation alone. I know one of the directors said that took them upwards of like two years to do. And it does make sense when you see it. And that goes into a lot of the diverse presentation mm-hmm. of the characters, because as we get talking about the film, there's a few moments that really stand out. And especially with that animation that it's not so, I want to say linear, mm-hmm. you know, like not everything looks the same from one art studio. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing. I I loved how they went with the creative side to present some of these characters too. And you really get such an amazing picture of what the Spider-Verse is because a lot of times when we talk multiverse, it can get a little weird. Mm -hmm. And I think that's being very polite. Yeah. And then when you see it presented like this, nothing got lost in translation. Is You really just get how just the theme of Spider-Man just resonates throughout the universe. Mm -hmm. And this is something that if you've been disenfranchised with Spider-Man for reasons, and we don't have to go into that. We talked about it last week. This reminds you of why you love that person as a character. So that being said, let's get in some spoiler talk. Shall we Pat? Sure. In three, two, one. Okay. Absolutely love this film. Mm -hmm. I think the it was stolen at certain points by Spider Punk, aka Hobie Brown, voiced by Daniel Kaluuya, mm-hmm. and I thought he just did this amazing job of just scene stealing throughout and giving a great counterbalance to what was going on between Oscar Isaac's Miguel O'Hara and Shamik Moore's Miles Morales, mm-hmm. because their battle, as you see how it progresses really started escalating and when Hobie Brown would jump in Mm -hmm. it would definitely break a little up and definitely bring things more connecting to the fans because you could understand why he was siding where he was during their entire struggle Mm -hmm. because where this film picks up is back on Gwen Stacy's earth Mm -hmm. because remember she's not part of the Miles universe yes so you see this great opening montage with Haley Seinfeld voicing uh, Gwen, and she's like doing her drums, and she's you know really reminiscing about her past, and you mm-hmm. go to see about how 
her Peter Parker was killed. Right. How her dad, who's the captain of the police department, is blaming her for it. Mm -hmm. And like you get this very quick like update about her world and how she's really missing um, Miles. Miles and just how she made friends there. And just you can see just how her living with her secret identity, much like we see with Peter Parker and Miles Morales. Yeah. Having that is a very, very tough job to handle because obviously mm-hmm. you want to talk to somebody about it and there's not a lot of superheroes going on, so to speak. No. But this does get broken up when there is a disturbance at the Guggenheim Museum and we do see that the vulture is there. Mm. Now, it's not the vulture we all know. This is the vulture from the Renaissance era. Hmm. That's interesting. And how they did the animation was almost like paper mache, all, like in a weird sense. Sure, sure. But visually, he jumps out. Right. Oh, of course. And you're going, yeah, but not even just for like the normal vulture look. It's like in comparison to the colors of the page, it's done in the Renaissance brown. Ah, uh, okay. So okay. it does look like the old Da Vinci uh, yeah. writings and pictures and yeah. such. So I loved how they did this. And this made perfect sense because this vulture is out of time. Hmm. So as you see, they're having this great standoff. I mean, you're seeing Spider Gwen at this point or Ghost Spider really step up and and start taking on the challenge. And she does get some help Mm -hmm. because suddenly coming through, you see Miguel Mm O'Hara, a.k.a. Spider-Man 2099. And we do see Jessica Drew, a.k.a. Spider-Woman, Voiced by Issa Rae. Hey, okay. And I will say this. Jessica Drew is a fantastic character, too. Mm. I know a lot of hype has been behind Spider-Punk, but Jessica Drew was fantastic in this film, too. And you do see how they're helping her take care of the vulture Mm -hmm. and more or less explain why things are going on because there's now a big time rift in the multiverse. Mm -hmm. And they're now trying to go deal with this. And you do see that while this is going on, Gwen winds up being recruited for what is known as the Spider Society. Mm. Even though Miguel is not too happy to take new recruits. Right. Like this is something he's very, very against. But Jessica Drew kind of does sell the point of like, we need all the help we can get. So she winds up escaping. Then we jump to Earth. 1610, which is the Ultimates universe, as I'm going to call it, but Miles Morales' universe. Mm -hmm. So we kind of see what's going on, and he's now trying to balance out life in school Mm -hmm. and also being Spider-Man. And you do see this is where he has just an impromptu run-in with the spot. The greatest Spider-Man villain of all time. I tell you what, how they presented this, it made perfect sense. And Jason Schwartzman, who voiced him, really did a great job because the spot, I mean, if you've read comics, you're never really saying he's a top whatever. He's not a threat. Yeah. He's a joke character. Yeah. Like, he, let's yeah, be honest. He's, he's like Batroc the Leaper. Like, you see Batroc show up, and you're like, oh, okay, whatever. Yeah. But in this situation, yeah, the spot, he just can create little portals. But as you see what he's trying to do... He doesn't really have control over himself as he's trying to rob an ATM in a bodega. Mm -hmm. It's failing miserably, but you do see this great action sequence when Miles is in there and he's trying to, uh, what you call it, stop him. And they wind up going all through the city until, well, the spot kind of disappears a little bit, but we do find out that there's reason behind it. Okay. The spot was actually a scientist that was involved in the original Alchemex explosion oh yeah from yeah the first film yeah so technically miles is responsible for his powers and his problems Be- Nor- normal superhero things yeah so it makes sense so as you see that they're fighting the spot more or less is taken off the board but he's not stopped right but you see miles is now going back to you know his normal duties and he's trying to have that great relationship with his parents and like i say i love the back and forth with his parents too because i mm-hmm. i think that they have just done such a fantastic job brian tyree henry is voicing his dad jeff and luna lauren velas is playing his mom rio and like they do such a great job about just being you know the parents and being very supportive of miles but they obviously don't know a superhero life and how that comes into play too because his dad is up for promotion to captain ah. see this is going to come into play a little later 
So after you see that when the spot encounter for the first time is taken care of and it's kind of left at this you know standstill, you see that Miles is now trying to resume a normal life. And it's not really happening so much, but he does wind up coming into contact with Gwen. Mm-hmm. Because Gwen is looking for the spot. Because how he originally disappeared from Miles, he kind of just transformed himself into a void. So now he's still in the 1610 universe. Right. And she's trying to find him, but she breaks kind of like any time travel law, Mm. which is what, Pad? If you go into time travel, are you supposed to talk to people? Nope. uh, Keep to yourself. Don't say nothing. Don't do nothing. You know, kind of just live. Sure enough. But Gwen breaks it because obviously she wants to talk to her friends. So they do have this great reconnecting. And Miles is knowing that she's up to something else, too, because she basically says, like, I can't stay, but I got something going on. (laughs) He winds up following her. Right. And you do see the spot is now growing in power. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of trying to enhance his things, uh, his abilities, because, well, I mean, quite frankly, you can only do so much. But in a situation, the more you can get, the more you can take revenge on, on Miles Morales. So it does play into the superhero elements of the story, and this is how it's very easy to connect with. But as you see, when Gwen goes to to capture the spot, it doesn't exactly work out, Mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of a time jump that she goes through a portal, and Miles has been sneaking behind to follow her to see what's going on right? and does the most rational decision ever. He follows her through the portal. Of course he does. So they wind up going to... Mumbatan, India. Mm-hmm. So you see that they are now chasing the spot through all the multiverse. And this Earth is known as Earth 5101. Okay. So as they're going through, they run into the Spider-Man, or Spider-Man of that universe, Pavrit Pabarkar. Okay. Uh, and this is kind of a version that you've seen in the comics, too. There was a Spider-Man India. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I love the representation here. I love this. I thought his character was absolutely awesome, too. So, definitely want to shout out Karen Sony, who voiced him, did a fantastic job. And you're seeing how they're going after the spot. And you do see that there's a name that's mentioned o- along the way, too. And that's Hobie Brown. And you're seeing that there's a little bit of jealousy going on with Miles about like Gwen keeps talking about him. And obviously, Pavrit uh, is mentioning him, too. So, you do see the teenage uh, love angst, so to speak, start coming through this Mm storyline a little bit. But you see that when Hobie comes in to more or less try stopping the spot from accessing yet another Alchemix um, collider, right? you do see that he just comes in with so much charisma and is kind of like the ultimate cool Spider-Man mm-hmm. who is just so DIY punk, it's not even funny. And I love, love, love the portrayal by Kaluye. I thought he just voiced him amazing because it was just, he came in there and was saying like, yeah, we got to stop this. But he does make like a kind of bond with Peter during this. But the explosion, though, does do some little ramifications too because you do see that in this event... Pavrit's girlfriend and her dad are in danger. Right. So while a bridge is collapsing, you're seeing that the spider team here is trying to do the right thing. And during this, they wind up making a save, or or Miles does, and winds up saving her dad. Mm -hmm. Which, after this happens, you do see this group of spider figures come down and they're like almost assessing the damage like damage control does. Sure. No pun intended with that. Right. And you do see that Miles is taken back to the center hub of the spider society. And one thing we don't know that's going on during this is the fact that Miles has now tagged along. He's causing time issues. Because he's the figure that's out of time. Ah, uh, okay. And this comes into play a little bit later because as he's now meeting the different spider men and or Spider-People, I should say, from the Spider Society, 
you do see he's running into a lot that we know from the comics. Mm-hmm. We do see one Ben Riley, <laughs> your favorite character, makes his appearance. Uh, yeah, which I I have to say how they use him in this in this reference, I didn't mind as much. Sure, Andy Samberg did a great job voicing him, and it plays into a lot of the '90s writing. Sure, so I wasn't as mad, but the uh, style that he was in animation, like really took from the panels. And it was almost like a panel for panel type deal. Sure. From in the comic because of how he was drawn. And I was like, okay, I, I can deal with this. And he does a lot of self brooding, which if you've ever read the nineties. Yeah, that happened a lot. Yeah, that's that's a that's a staple. So I didn't mind that as much. So then when you see that Peter is finally uh meeting up with Miguel O'Hara, well, we kind of find out what was going on with this. And the reason everybody went back is Apparently, according to Miguel, during all this time period, mm-hmm. there there's a death that causes Spider-Man to be, and you can't mess with what he calls canon events. Sure. So during this, we find out that the police captain of uh, uh, Spider-Man India's Earth, yeah, was supposed to have died. Oh. And you do see this long like timeline of where you've seen a, a key figure in the yeah. uh, whoever the uh, spider person is of that planet, the respective planet, has somebody dying. Right. So, like for example, in Gwen's universe, it was supposed to be Peter. Par- it was Peter Parker, kind of. Yeah. You do see the movie flashbacks, so we see Andrew Garfield's Uncle Ben. Right. We see Tobey Maguire's Uncle Ben. Right. And their scenes together, so they did splice in a lot of the actual movie footage in. Sure. So, like I say, there was, uh, there's a couple quick nods in there. I know there was a brief one that was kind of a little funny cameo for Venom, so they even tagged that in. Uh, sadly, no Morbius for anybody watching. Oh shucks. Yeah. Oh, uh, no. Anyway. I, exactly. But it comes down to revealing the true plot of this movie, which I know we were kind of questioning when we did the preview episode, because we thought, like, how is this spot going to be involved and there was going to be something else? Right. Well, Miguel O'Hara <laughs> being convinced that the canon events are now being torn apart. We do find out that Miles Morales allegedly is the original anomaly mm. for all canon events because his spider that he got his powers from, well, wasn't from his Earth. Mm-hmm. It was supposed to be from Earth 42. Mm. But due to reasons, he is what he is. Yeah. So this does play into how Miguel O'Hara sees the world because everything that he's tried doing to conquer his own personal canon event, he failed at, and it caused a time rift as well. So he's now dedicated his life to making sure the time stream is fine. But obviously the emergence of of Miles as Spider-Man has kind of thrown more of a problem into place than not. But during this as well, as well it's revealed that you do see that there is another canon event that's going to be happening on Miles Morales' Earth. Mm-hmm. His dad is getting promoted to captain in a few days. Mm. So now knowing this question, Pat, I'm going to throw this to you. If you if you were in Miles' shoes and you knew what was going to be happening to your family in a couple days, what would you do? Try and save him. Exactly. Which causes Miguel to lose his mind. Yeah, I can understand that. So it, it's the understandable thing in the sense of, Save one life or save the multiverse. Right. Because obviously if you keep messing with the time stream, you're causing more problems, and it just snowballs from there. So this is kind of a crazy play that happens. Yeah. But you do see that Spider-Man basically says, well, I'm going back to my Earth and saving him. I'm not going to sit here and be just completely oblivious to everything. All the while, you have Peter B. Parker back with his now daughter, Mayday, mm-hmm. who is originally Peter Parker's mentor, who does provide a little bit of comic relief. I was surprised at how much he was not in the film till the end. Mm. Um, so Jake Johnson was back voicing him, too, and really trying to be a voice of reason because, as you see, there's this fantastic action sequence where Miguel, where Miguel is chasing after Miles, and Miles is like literally fighting his way through all the spider people right. in the spider society, which is awesome. And you even get at one point the infamous meme of pointing. Right. Because they say Spider Man's on the second floor and everybody goes, Who? Me, me, me. Yeah. So it's cool how they set that up. I loved how they did that. But you do see that when Miles is hiding, 
he does have a kind of heart to heart with Peter. And it's kind of just brought up like Peter is saying, there's really nothing we can do. This is mm-hmm. what happens. And Miles just is refusing to hear this. So he does wind up making this dramatic escape through their time prison, so to speak, I guess I would say. Sure. Because what they do is for all the villains that they catch, they're out of the timeline. They do put them in this weird like spider cocoon Mm -hmm. that's all of energy, and then they send them back to whatever time or earth they're supposed to be on. So Miles winds up sneaking back in Mm -hmm. and wiring everything to send him back to where he thinks his earth is. Mm. So he does this because when all he hears is Earth 42, he winds up getting sent to Earth 42. Mm -hmm. Gwen at this point is considered a little bit disloyal. She's now sent back to her home planet. Uh, So she's out of the picture. And Miles does land back in Earth 42. Mm -hmm. A little bit of help, but there is some little problems that he has to come across with because when he meets his parents, he finally reveals he's Spider-Man, or to his mom, I should say, rather. Mm -hmm. And she's like, who's that? And he's devastated because his whole thing to get back and save his dad, he finds out on this Earth... Mm-hmm. His dad has already passed. Mm. And then he winds up becoming in the crosshairs of his uncle who was originally killed in Into the Spider-Verse. Mm-hmm. So Aaron Davis is back as the prowler in this. And you see that Marshall Ali is back voicing him. Nice. And they wind up taking our Miles capture. Mm. So you see that he's now tied up to like a boxing bag. Yeah. And you do see that the prowler is messing with his glove and, and Miles is sitting there trying to reason with him. But we do see that there is a figure on this Earth 42 mm-hmm. that we don't really know, but he looks very, very familiar. Okay. And it turns out that on this Earth, Miles Morales became the prowler. Oh, okay. So they wind up leaving a little bit of a standoff going on here. All the while, Gwen goes back to her Earth, reconnects with her dad because it was very estranged that he was vowing to capture uh, Spider-Gwen. He does see the realization that that's who it is, and instead of following through with his cannon event, he retires from the police force. Mm -hmm. So thus the captain never dies. All the while, you do see that Spider-Punk, who has been helping Miles Morales the entire time, also helps Gwen out. Sure. Because he leaves a package at her dad's place. Mm Mm-hmm. It's a time portal. Oh, okay. Which most of the spider society has, so she can jump back in and help Peter or help Miles, I should say. So you do see that all signs are pointing to a very big showdown happening on Earth sixteen ten because for all the spider society knows, Mm -hmm. Miles is there, but he's not. Mm. So now you do see the Gwen who comes back and does have a, another interaction with her parents. I didn't mention it a lot earlier, but there was an original talk between Gwen, Miles, and Miles' parents. Mm-hmm. You do see Gwen comes back and she's asking where Miles is, and they don't know where he is either. So all the while, you do have the spot is making moves, so they're setting up there. And Gwen does what is one of the cooler scenes in the movie – she reassembles a team to go find Miles and stop the spot. And the team is all of these Spider-Men that we saw in the original film. Mm -hmm. So into the Spider-Verse, Spider-Ham is back. Right. Spider-Man Noir is back. Yeah. You do see that now you have Spider-Man India is back. You have... Uh, Spider-Punk is there. Right. So they've loaded up this team. Uh, Peter's back with Mayday. He took his daughter with him. And like I say, you just have this lineup ready to go to. It was just awesome to see everybody played out. Uh, oh, you had two. I forgot. Uh, Peeny Parker. Oh, who, yeah, she yeah. had the robotic suit yeah. from uh, the original one. So she's now there too. Like I say, they loaded up. And all the while, you do see that Miguel O'Hara, Jessica Drew, and Ben Riley are on this earth too. And they're trying to find Peter. So everything leads up to a big showdown because that's literally how everything ends. Mm. So it's kind of a very straightforward movie in the sense 
there's a lot of cool moments that happen in the middle. Mm-hmm. And I would say the, that's the only part for me. I don't want to say it drug out a little bit. Right. But it's a lot of nostalgia. It's a lot of things for the fans. Like if I have to break this down in the good, the bad, and the you know WTF yeah. like we used to do. Yeah. The good portion is it really represented Spider-Man and really showed the effect he has on the multiverse. And just how he inspires everybody from Spider-Gwen to even Jessica Drew to... Miguel O'Hara to Spider Punk, who is now going to be the big talk out of this movie. Hobie Brown, I don't, I would not be shocked if we saw another Spider Punk series come out of this. I can see it. But you see about how just Spider Man's essence and literal moral code translates throughout the multiverse. And I thought they did that well. I thought the creativity amongst how they did the animation was mm-hmm. really well. Mm-hmm. Like I said, Spider Punk stood out and really felt like the old. Um, I almost want to say like the Sex Pistol co- covers. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like the different um, writing and style and just like everything's kind of like, you know, made into like a collage for him, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I thought they did that awesome with him. I love how they did the vulture with him. I loved how they did the little tie-ins to the movies. And really, I thought they, they might have spent a little too much time trying to have that back and forth with Miles and... With the Spider Society, I think I, they gave a lot of time too, which I, I'm not saying it was a bad thing, mm-hmm. but I think for where they needed to get with the story, I think the the middle section of it might have taken a little too long, in my opinion. Sure. Not saying anything's bad with it, because a lot of it was fan nostalgia. Like I say, you get to see all the different Spider people throughout the universe, and it's great and all. But then, uh, like how they tried doing Miguel O'Hara, it is true to the comics to a sense because he's not a traditional Spider-Man by any any stretch of the imagination. Right, that's the vibe I've always gotten. Yeah, because how they did the 2099 line is a whole different ball of wax. It's no real radioactive spider <laughs> biting him, so to speak. Like I say, it's a great series to go pick up if you got the time on Marvel Unlimited or at your comic shops to do. But how they set him up, they dive into a little bit, but they also try making him come off a little more sympathetic, and you don't really get that vibe. That's the only thing I will say is, is like, my bad portion of this. Mm-hmm. Like, he comes off pretty much like like a jerk. And you understand why when you see it. But, like I say, I didn't really feel like there was a sympathetic thing for him. Right. Because when you see how Miles presents his argument to him, Miguel is so, like, blinded with this is the way mm-hmm. that he's not even hearing it. And if it's one thing about Spider-Man – there's always with great power comes re- great responsibility, but there's always the line that's more recent than not is nobody dies. And no matter what, you put yourself through that ultimate cost. That's been more so in the comics, albeit though we'll exclude uh, Amazing Spider-Man 26, just for reasons. Right. But in that sense, that's been something Spider-Man's been living off of for many, many years. So to see this all play out, like I say, I thought they kind of just really drugged that part of the story out a little bit. And by the time he started doing a lot of world hopping, this, right. like it did get, I would say a little confusing, but it was kind of like, all right, are we here yet? Or what's going on here? But I do love the creativity they did with this. And I, I can't really fault it too much in that sense. Sure. Like I say, I thought the voice acting was on point and just how they did the swerves too, because especially when you see that Miles winds up on Earth 42 instead of his home world. Mm-hmm. That's a great swerve because you don't realize it until just the very end. And I don't really think there was anything that was WTF about this, right? to be honest with you. I think it was pretty much straightforward. And like I say, everybody that they depicted had a different feel, a different vibe to them. And that's one thing I loved about the diversity of the spider people too as well, that everybody just had a different energy to them. And I thought it just it, when they all meshed together, it really made for some great scenes. Like I say, we've already seen more in Steinfeld talk and have that interaction before same thing with uh johnson and and uh more too mm-hmm. so like i say that wasn't that was just like picking up the bike and going like i said johnson and more had that great relationship in the first movie you didn't see a lot of it here and when they when they did put it in it made sense mm-hmm. but i think for the new characters coming in i thought they did a great job about establishing themselves and i think this all leads to what's going to be a very very epic sequel or trilogy ending yeah that we know that they've been talking about rolling out Gwen Stacy into her own film. I don't doubt that we see in some way, shape, or form a spider punk. Eh, I could see it. In some way. I, I don't know if they do a full length or they would try doing something. 
in the same lines of the Disney Plus shows. I know it's Disney and Sony and it's right, different, but right, right. Money, t- money talks and different things happen. All right, I'm just gonna put that out there. But I think if they wanted to run with it, they can. And I am very, very intrigued to see what they do for this because I thought they set up for a great cliffhanger ending with Miles in danger, Gwen Form and the team, and Miguel's squad on the hunt. Mm-hmm. And I thought how they did all that was making a lot of sense too. And I almost forgot the best part about this too. Yeah. We did have one live action cameo that I guess I'll file under WTF and I'll just add uh, why the why the F not. Okay. We had in one of the Spider Society prisons that they had because where they put all the uh, time displaced villains. Yeah. Donald Glover live action playing the Prowler. Hmm. Like he did huh. in the uh, Spider-Man films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's there. Huh. As himself, like, well, he's as Hobie Brown. Yeah. But he's playing himself, which I just, I loved how they did that. Like, I was, I was just completely thinking that was one of the cooler scenes. And it's just one that I don't want to say it flew under the radar, so to speak, but it definitely wasn't thing, anything I was expecting to see. Yeah. And then, sure enough, when you see him on screen, and it's been something that we've all thought like he was going to be in the live action film right, at right, some point. Right. I thought it was a very cool nod to him. So, like I say, Nothing really seemed really too out of whack for this. I mean, Spider-Verse, in closing, I think just really gave fans a lot to discuss and a lot of different looks for Spider-Man that you might have forgotten about that this character was a a Spider-Man at one point, or Spider-Person, I should say. And I thought how that came off, they pulled it off splendidly. Juggling a big cast like that is never easy. Mm -hmm. And yet I feel that most everybody got enough screen time too. And I thought that Spider Punk and Jessica Drew really sold the scenes when they were in. Yeah, I would have liked to seen maybe more of them per se, but at the end of the day, it comes down to Peter, Gwen, and Miles. And I thought they did a great job setting that up, and even making the spot an interesting villain too, because he's just obsessed with ruining Peter Parker's life, and he was going to be the responsible party for what happens to mm-hmm. Peter's dad inadvertently, so to speak. But now he's just growing in more power because they can't stop him. So. The stakes have never been higher in this franchise. And listen, I tell you what, I can't wait to see the sequel when it comes out. I'm, just, I'm putting it out there right now. We will be there opening night. That said, ODPH Society, hit me up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What did you think about Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse? What score did you give it? I don't like giving out too many scores for this, but if I have to do an official one, an 8.5 out of 10. I thought it was damn near perfect. Like I say, just a little long in certain parts for me. But I think that it really nailed the essence and really reminded me about why Spider-Man connects with so many people. But I want to hear your opinions. So hit us up on that hashtag. Let us know your thoughts. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hi, and welcome to The Capsule Life, a show for the most casual and dedicated fans of comics and a member of the Comic Watch family. I'm your host, Sean. Join me and discover what the world of comics and graphic novels have to offer. From one-on-one interviews with industry professionals, roundtable discussions with passionate fans, and reviews on the latest comics, TV shows, and movies. You can also check out our website, www.thecaptionlife.com, to find out where you can listen to us, a list of all of our episodes, and where you can find us on social media under the user name at caption life you'll get a new episode from us every week so hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out coming back on another segment on this edition of the odph podcast and we have to recap yet again another classic episode of the cw and dc comics hit show superman and lois Mm -hmm. season three has definitely been one that has really kept fans intrigued with the storylines especially now bringing in more classic Superman villains to the small screen in the form of Bruno Mannheim, played by Chad L. Coleman. So the title characters of Superman and Lois, played by Tyler Hoechlin and Elizabeth Tullock, have really had their hands full this entire season, along with a few other storylines going on. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to be doing is recapping the latest episode entitled Complications. So, Pad, what is the spoiler-free statement? Uh, Fantastic episode, start to finish. Loved everything about it. Uh, heavy with the emotions on this one. Mm. Really, really pulled at the heartstrings for it. Uh, but next week's episode, holy shit. Yes, I fully agree with you. I thought this one had a lot of emotion behind it, and they really have set things in motion for their return in two weeks with an episode entitled Injustice. Now, 
being the ultimate injustice fan that I am, I would love to see that universe cross over <laughs> and, we, and we do a one a one time time jump there. I'd be okay with it. But I don't know how this is all going to play out because the stakes got really interesting. And by what we have seen uh, coming to Smallville, all bets are off mm-hmm. on what to expect with only a few episodes left in this season. So that said, Pad, in three, two, one, talk to me. Like I said, the episode was was very emotional, pulled at the heartstrings. You know, I loved everything. I loved everything about it. You know, the the storyline. You know, we got with Pia was very emotional. The stuff with Lois equally as emotional because I genuinely did not know what the hell they were going to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I felt it would have been a wild choice to go the opposite direction of what they ended up going. You know, but a great episode start to finish. I agree with you too. I think they had a lot going on, especially with Lois's storyline and Pia's that we knew. Something was going to happen involving Pia. They've been setting up um, with her escaping from the DOD that I was expecting we were going to have a little bit more uh, coming out from this with Bizarro, as they've been teasing, and even Bruno Mannheim. But I I would say I loved how they did the ending for her story, too. Mm -hmm. I thought, and like I said, that did hit you in all the emotions as well. So, And that's something that they've done a really good job this season about Making Bruno Mannheim and Intergang more human, like yeah. as, as weird as that sounds, yeah. But they've now really made a point to make them compelling characters, giving them of some just, dimensions. Yeah, because a lot of times, especially uh, more classic heroes like Superman, Batman, there isn't that much layers to their villains. Right. It's more straightforward, conquering the world. I mean, Bruno Mannheim is a typical villain you would see from like the golden age of comics in like the 30s and 40s where hey they're fighting the mafia they're fighting the mob they're fighting the <laughs> bad guys yeah so when you see this like i say it, it really just elevates their characters up just a little bit further and this goes to kick right off into the episode too because lois is now getting ready for her surgery and she's getting a double mastectomy mm-hmm. so the family is getting ready to support her during this and all, all the while, they're dealing with the Mannheims now escaping and basically plotting their next moves. Yeah. Because Pia is now freed from the DOD. Mm-hmm. Bruno Mannheim has reunited the family, and they're more or less planning their big escape. Yeah. Because obviously, they're going to be hunted down by the DOD. Yeah. Because obviously, they're fugitives. So, yeah, they kind of fuck with the government, and while well, the government's not too thrilled about it. Right. But before they get into that. Lois has Clark and the family put together a big dinner mm-hmm. right before she goes for surgery. Yep. So they get, what was the name of this place again? I forgot. It's Bazongas. I think that's the name of the, I don't know if that's the name of the place or the name of the meal. No, it was, it was the name of the place because yeah. it was a ripoff of Hooters. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, that's so what it is. Yeah. Lois gets everybody together. So the kids are there as well. So you do see that Lon is over there, played by Emmanuel Kirky. Wally Parks is there as John Henry Irons. Yep. They're having a dinner while the kids are all eating as well, too. So you're, you're seeing everybody back, and that's getting more tentious. Awkward. Well, obviously, the will they, won't they, forever in a day romance going on between Alex Garfin's Jordan and Indy Neverett's Sarah is just getting more dramatic and not going anywhere. See, I didn't mind it this week though, just because of the tension and kind of the bitterness between the two Mm -hmm. where it was, it wasn't just an, Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. But we're saying it in different ways and we don't know what each other meant. Like, no, there was some actual, like they might be done, done with this. And I'm like, okay, I don't mind this. This isn't the same. We're just going to tread water in place. We're going to run on a treadmill and not go anywhere with this. You know, there was actually some like, okay, we're kind of slowly moving things along here. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just to the point now when I see him there, that's just my gut reaction. Just because we've, we've done this for so long. But it did add for a little more tension going on. And like I say, with the other family members there, Jonathan Kent played by Michael Bishop and Natalie Irons played by Taylor Buck. Like I say, you do have the the teens actually have a decent storyline going on because everybody has something there too. Mm-hmm. But it really kind of falls back onto what this show is about, and barring a little bit from the Fast and Furious, yeah, it's, it's all about family. family. So we do have that kind of cool sequence to kick things off, and then while Lois is prepping for you know you know having like a, a final you know meal before surgery with yeah. everybody, and just really kind of you know talking about everything that's been going on. 
you do see that in Metropolis, mm-hmm. things are not going so well for Pia. No. And we do see that the experimental cure mm-hmm. that Bruno Mannheim has been dabbling with all season. That we haven't seen him do anything with. Just, hey, I've got this. Trust me. Well, we've seen him use the Superman blood synthetic or right. whatever you want to define that as. We, we know that Bizarro Superman is there. We know he's using him in some capacity for this cure. We don't know what. We mm. don't know what. Other than we know he's there and we know he's testing him. We've seen nothing of like the process of A to B start to finish of how he got here. Right. The only thing we know is he has a Frankenstein-esque laboratory yeah. that he hangs out in. It's in his basement. Yep. And he's tested this out on a few other people throughout the season, yeah, which have had less than stellar success. That he's brought people back from the dead in almost like a weird, like zombie esque state, so to speak. Effectively, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, except they're a little more coherent than what they talk, but it's not. It's it's just still very wide open about the scope of this range of what it can do. Like I say, it's it's a very weird thing to see, but we just kind of chalk it up to what pad. Reasons. reasons all the while though pia who's played by dia via day Videa, has been just lights out in this role and you see that she's now really breaking down because like she can't control her powers anymore mm-hmm. and just with so much that she's getting in like i say she gets injected with another dose of the serum mm-hmm. and is causing everything to lose control and you're seeing that for the first time in this series Bruno Mannheim feels out of control. And she has utterly no control of her powers because she starts losing control of her powers. M- Matteo and Bruno start freaking the fuck out. And mm-hmm. they're like, oh, we got to do something to help her. So logically, Bruno goes, oh, we'll get more of the serum. Mm-hmm. So he looks at one of his goons, says, hey, go get more of the serum. So he brings a briefcase, suitcase, whatever the hell the thing is. They inject her with more serum. It works for mm, all of a second. Yeah. And he and, and she starts losing control of her powers again. And he goes, go get more. We're going to figure this out. Yeah. And he goes running towards a subway car. What looks like what looked to me like a subway car. Mm-hmm. And he goes running towards this thing, and she loses control of her powers again, fires a sonic blast at him unwillingly and uncontrollably, and this dude dies. And when I say dies, he doesn't just, like, drop dead, eyes roll back, and I said, no, this dude is turned into soup. Yeah. This guy is gone. There is not enough left to give him a proper burial. Right. So we do see that, obviously, with the stakes now getting more out of control, Bruno's acting more irrationally. Yeah. And this is now starting to affect everyone in Metropolis. Yeah. And especially at the hospital, Lois is, is getting her surgery done in. Because it's because uh, her powers, being sonic and causing vibrations, are causing earthquakes. And it's causing, you know, I think at one point in the episode they called it the big one for Metropolis. Mm-hmm. And it's causing rolling blackouts in the city just because it's messing with all of the infrastructure and, and the power lines. Right. So you do see that Lois tells Clark it's okay to go because he obviously wants to be there for his wife. Right. But she's like, no, you need to go handle this. Go be Superman. I'll be fine. And also the doctors in the hospital give her the option because at one point before they, they bring her in for surgery, the power goes out. And they're, mm-hmm. they're like, hey, listen, we can do this. But if you don't want to do it right now because of what's going on, we're totally understandable. Yeah. And she makes the decision. No, go ahead. Go forward with it. Yeah. So you do see the family is is still sitting there. Jordan and Jonathan are in the waiting room. Yep. And you do see that during this time period, Jordan has now inherited another power from Superman. Yeah. And what is that? Uh, the X-ray vision. Yes. So this was a cool sequence to see play out because at first you didn't know what was going on. Yeah. At first I thought it was like, he, I was like, oh, he's getting a new power. I wonder what he's getting. I'm like, oh, is he getting heat vision? I'm like, no, wait, he's already got that. And then you started seeing the, the x-rays and I'm like, oh, he's getting the x-ray vision. Yeah. So it was cool how they did that introduction for the powers. Yeah. yeah. And it's something like I say, you're now seeing the birth of Superman through Jordan's eyes, which is a very cool take they're doing. Mm-hmm. Albeit, though, it, it, when he gets a little whiny, it, it's it's a bit much. But I understand. Yeah. He, he's a teenager. It's, it, it is what they do. But we do see that he's in the waiting room and obviously he catches one of the uh, tanks in the operating room start to fall. So yeah. he flies in quick and out to save it. And you see that Jonathan's just kind of sitting there like, everything okay? And he's like, yeah, yeah, everything's yeah, no, fine. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, so it's kind of a really interesting play how they're doing this. Meanwhile, Lois's dad is back at the DOD Uh and trying to maintain calm because obviously there's a threat going on. So Dylan Walsh, uh, who plays General Sam Lane, is doing a great job in his role too because before he was being a very concerned parent. Sure, sure. And this season I think they've really dived into the fact that 
he is a, a family man and he is a parent. Yeah. More so than we've seen the past two seasons. He, he's more than just a four-star general. Right. So I liked how they did this dynamic too. All the while, they were giving a solid storyline to Natalie because she goes to investigate Bruno's uh, penthouse. Well, I don't know if it's necessarily she's going to investigate the penthouse. I think she's just trying to find... Well, she's trying to find Mateo. She's but... trying to find Mateo because it's brought up at the dinner before the surgery that, like, I forget which which brother it is she brings it up with, or maybe it's both. But she brings up that, like, everything that happened in the last episode and how all of a sudden now he's just vanished. He's dropped off the face of the earth and she can't get a hold of him. And obviously she still has feelings for him because she's like, listen, I know he did. I know it's not great what he did, but I still love him. Yeah. So you do see that he winds, she winds up going to the penthouse and she tracks him down. Yeah. And her dad does follow her in suit. <laughs> yeah, he does. So there is that standoff that is going on because once Bruno shows up to track down Mateo, because they do wind up having a reconnection. Yeah. It kind of leaves in a very weird standstill. And it does lead to Superman coming in there and more or less bringing in Bruno. Yeah. Well, it kind of sets up for it because, like I say, all the while, Pia is still going crazy in Metropolis. Yeah, and at this point, she's fled the building, you know, and she's wandering the streets of Metropolis with her powers, now going off continuously, not in short bursts, nonstop continuously, continuing to shake the foundations of the, of the earth around there, the buildings and everything else, but it's also like shattering people's eardrums. Yeah, so this plays into a big factor that Superman has to go deal with her and literally winds up reasoning with her just enough Mm -hmm. and she knows that she's not gonna be able to stop her powers but he winds up getting close enough that he can fly her into the sky yeah and you do see that there is something that's whispered in her is here uh, into his area thank you so we don't know what that is at the time but you do see them go up in the sky we're watching all metropolis is watching this unfold yeah and she explains explodes right because well the powers explode out of her the, I should say yeah that. the powers explode out of her and and bruno and mateo wanted to go be with her and but the, uh natalie realized well no you can't you know we won't survive long enough mm-hmm. and bruno looks at john and goes is there anything superman can do to help her and john looks at him and he and for as much as they have in differences between the two of them john looks at bruno and goes i don't know yeah. You know, so Bruno and Mateo are now having to watch helplessly, you know, from a distance, you know, what's going on. And they, and they see him fly up into the air. The, the music, the audio cuts out and it just plays this somber music. And then you see the explosion and like something out of Crisis on Infinite Earths, which is what it reminded me of. Mm. You see Superman flying back towards the Bruno penthouse with with Pia in his arms. Yeah. And he winds up you know, laying down with our, her down on the ground and Bruno, you know, Holds her too. Yeah. And he says, which to paraphrase a bit, he's like, she just wants to know that she loves you and always will. And yeah, and that will never stop no matter where, you know, she is. So it's a very emotional scene because you see Mateo and Bruno just start breaking down. Yeah. And like I say, this leads to them now going to the DOD mm-hmm. in custody. Yep. So it's kind of like a real like fast pace what's going on here, but there's so many moving parts because you do have the Irons family sitting there watching this happen. Mm -hmm. There's a very tender moment too where you see Natalie grab her dad's hand, yeah, you know, and just watching this all unfold. And you're just like that's the biggest point that connects with the audience, I think, for this episode is just that emotional, you know, grieving Mm -hmm. that is happening. Like I say, it, it just ties back into how they've really made Bruno into a sympathetic character. Yeah this entire season instead of just making him like he is in the comics, which is like the whole thing is like, they're not just making him, Oh, I'm a megalomaniac. Who's looking to rule the city, rule the world, rule the universe. I'm just trying to save my wife. Yeah. Which can't fault him. No, you can't. And that's one thing that I love how they've been really pushing the ethical question on this, that you're seeing that pop up a lot more in shows recently is just, what would you do if you're in that position? Mm -hmm. And like I say, when you see this all unfold, that's what really plays into some strengths. And like I say, the acting on this episode was really, really good. So definitely excited about that. But it does leave for a very puzzling conclusion. Mm-hmm. And I know we didn't get into a lot about Chrissy and Kyle. and it was wrapped up. It started and wrapped up in the episode. Yeah, that was that was very quickly done. Kyle, so. Kyle got everything explained to him. He was at first excited. Superman took off. Then he was pissed off at Chrissy because she lied to him. And she's like, well, I had to lie because I made a promise. No, that doesn't excuse the lie. He's a dick. 
he and then later in the episode he he gets told by Lana, "Hey, stop being a dick. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not being a dick. No, you're being a dick, and you know what I'm talking about." Yeah. And then he has a he passes it out with Chrissy. So you know, start middle end. I will say this: it was probably the least favorite part of the episode for me because yeah. I was expecting more yeah. of some drama between Kyle and Clark. Yeah. And I thought that that was just tied up too nicely. I mean, he, he kind of explained it though once because we didn't get the full explanation. We came in and Clark had already explained it. And Kyle's already reasoning in, in his head. And he goes, you know, I always thought you were a weird kid when we were growing up in gym class. And mm-hmm. he goes, now that I know this, it kind of explains a few things. Yeah. Like I say, his character is growing on me. I mean, yeah. Eric Velez, who plays Kyle, is like slowly winning me over. He's just, yeah, I don't know, something about him. But like I said, that was probably the weakest part of this because we go right to literally the end of the episode. Bruno Mannheim is cutting a deal yeah. for Matteo's freedom. Yeah. Which General Lane is all but too happy to sign. Well, and, and I know my girlfriend Liz was like, oh, can he make this decision? And I'm like, yeah, he's a four-star general. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. military system, four-star general is one of the highest uh, ranks you can get in the U.S. Army. The only rank higher is a five-star general, and that's reserved for times of war. Yeah. I want to say the last one given was General Patton during World War II. Mm -hmm. So they don't give this out a lot, if ever. So uh, honestly, the only rank higher than than the four-star general, I think, would be the president. Right. And I, and I don't think the president's going to exactly veto him on this at the moment. No, he's not going to veto him at all. But it just yeah. thought it, it played into such yeah. an interesting setup that now Bruno is going to give over all the information he, he can possibly do. Everything? Well, that's the question I had because we do see at the end, after this deal is made and – yeah. The, it's kind of another deal broker too with John Henry Irons yes. and Mateo. Yes, because Mateo doesn't want Bruno to cut the deal. He's like, no, listen, I can't let you, you know, throw your life throw away. your life away because of my mistakes. You deserve to live the life you you deserve. And he looks at John and he and he basically goes, you know, as long as he'll have a healthy home to live in, you know, will you watch after him? And John goes, you have my word. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I did too. Just. Like, where is this going to go? But I thought the bigger tell was he's going to confess everything. Yeah. And then we're left with Bizarro finally waking up in the Frankenstein yeah, laboratory. And leaving. And leaving. So we haven't had anything going on there to know, like, how he survived last season and where his mental state is now. Is he going to be speaking in the traditional Bizarro tone? Next time we see him. Me and Pizarro. Yeah, like, are we going to see that? I mean, I think that'd be awesome if oh, it was. I'd love it. But the bigger question that we have is, we do know that Bruno Mannheim is tied into Lex Luthor's imprisonment. Yeah. And we did see by the previews for next week, Luthor comes home. Yeah, he does. So now the question becomes, what does Bruno give away, and is he going to be gone now? Well, we know the article is out there from Lois and Chrissy from the Smallville newspaper about mm-hmm. about her. Presumably the information, and now they never read on air what was in the article, but presumably, you know, what happened in the truth of Lex's thing is in there. So that's why he's getting let out, or it's or it's a combination of, the article plus what Bruno gives up. Right. So we're going to have a lot of questions for next week. Yeah, we are. Well, two weeks, I should say, because they're taking next week off. Yeah, that's true. Because of WB reasons. Yeah. Or CW reasons. CW reasons, say. yeah. But overall, Pat, final thoughts on the episode. Fantastic episode. Really, one of the better ones they've done this this season, I got to say, from start to finish. Other than like other than like you, the, the Kyle Chrissy thing, which I'm like, eh. You know, didn't really care for. It was a fantastic episode. I I, I fully agree. I thought the acting this episode by Elizabeth Tolick, um, Dea Valdea, and um, Chad L. Coleman. I I thought all three of them really stepped it up for this episode and gave it just such an emotional performance. Then the only thing, like I say, just because we had no payoff was Kyle and Chrissy. Yeah, like it was like, did we even need that? And and I'm sorry, like. In my opinion, no. Like we could have skipped out on that. You could you could even give him more time to the little Sarah deal, 
that now that she's um, been grounded, I know they had the quick sequence where yeah. Kyle and Lana had a had a quote unquote talk with talk her. Talk with her, yeah. But like honestly, I think you could spend more time on that instead of the Chrissy storyline for for just this episode. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, uh, Sophie Hammock has been playing this really great role. She's a high school student. Like she, she even brings it up in the episode. She's a high school student who hasn't graduated yet. She's looking to go to college, and she's got a DUI on her record that stays with her for five years. And she and she even goes my college career is ruined before I can even try. Yeah. But like I say, if they wanted to focus more on that, this episode, I think it would have been okay. So, you know, like I said, Sophia Hammock or Hasmick, she is great as Chrissy. And like I say, if they wanted to take away a little bit from this and then come back to it next episode, I would have been more fine with it. But overall, like I say, it's been a great episode and it leads into all signs pointing to Luthor coming to Smallville. Lot to talk about for that episode when it drops, but in the meantime, hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHPod. What is your thoughts about the latest episode of Superman and Lois entitled Complications? Let's talk about it, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, guys. It's Alan Dufford here from Top Hat Studios, co-writer and co-creator of Pocus Hocus and Grandma Chainsaw, and you guys are listening to the ODPH Podcast. I'm going to beat them to the punch because they can't bring me down if I'm already under. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pat, what you got? Got two things to talk about, uh, both of which are trailer related because these decided to drop today as we record. Uh, The first of which is a brief 30 second trailer for the upcoming Star Wars series Ahsoka, which drops, uh, we found out, on August the 23rd. Let's go. Super excited for this because the trailer looks awesome. They mentioned Heir to the Empire, which, you know, will get a pop out of me every time I hear it. This is true. Uh, This is true. Uh, You see the uh, Rebels crew, the Star Wars Rebels crew, if you're familiar with them, so you you see Harris and Dula, Sabine, uh, Ahsoka, and then you see a brief uh, uh, background back shot of Thrawn. Looks amazing. Looks awesome. I cannot wait for this show to come out. Of course, you also see Hugh Yang, uh, the droid played by David Tennant in The Clone Wars, making his triumphant return. So anytime you get David Tennant, it's a good show. Exactly. David Tennant, I mean, you can't go wrong with it. I mean, the show has got so much hype behind it. Yes. Like. I can't see it faltering. Just all the moves that we know of thus far yeah. have been on point. So I can't see this really you know not hitting the landing yeah. uh and then i'm gonna talk about another trailer that dropped today and boy are we excited for god this one. bless it let's go expendables four baby the real family oh my god this movie looks insane i know it was rumored for a while they were gonna be doing it and then it was kind of on again off again and you know but now no it's happening uh it is releasing on september 22nd if i'm not mistaken uh, and you've got a whole new cast of people in. Yep, uh, September 22nd is when it's releasing. Of course, Jason Statham is returning. Dolph Lundgren is, is returning. Randy Couture is returning. Obviously, Sylvester Stallone is returning because you can't have this movie without Sly. He's the franchise. This is true. Uh, but joining them in the film this time, Megan Fox. Uh, 50 Cent is in the movie. Interesting. Yeah, it is. Uh, you've also got Tony Jaws in the movie. Uh, Jacob Schiappo, Levi Tran, Andy Garcia is in the movie as well, along with uh, Iko Uwais. Uh, this Listen, it's Expendables. The plot is only needed to move them from action scene to action scene. I don't need much else. It's going to be awesome. I just need explosions. Yes. This is I, seriously. If you're going into the Expendables asking for a story, yeah, you're going into the wrong movie. Yes, like this is the debate. I'll, I'll, I won't say names, but we have a debate going on right now in one of our chats about Expendables versus Fast uh, and the Furious. You don't go for the plot; you go for the action sequence. Yeah, you go for the action. You go to see just the most random stuff get blown up. Or yeah, I mean, there, there's a reason these movies come out when it's hot and 90 plus degrees outside. Yeah, it's like, oh hey, shit, it's too hot. I need to get inside and. Uh, cool off. I'm going to go watch this action movie where I don't need to think about it. And plus, it's always cool to see the stars of yesterday come yes. out and do this. I mean, granted, at their age, like, I'm surprised. <laughs> I really am. I mean, that on the nicest sincerity way possible. Yeah. But to see them do stuff and the stuff they do at this age, it's like, man. Something tells me Dolph and Sly ain't doing their own stunts. Uh, in least, my, in least, my eyes, Dolph does. At least not anymore. Yeah. At least not anymore. So... We've just got some comic picks going on right now. So, Pad, you know I defer to you to kick us off. Sure. Uh, so we're going to talk about two from DC and then two from Marvel. Uh, the two from DC, One of the first one is Adventures of Superman, John Kent. Uh, this one from Tom Taylor. This has been an awesome read and is only getting better. 
I uh, cannot wait to read this one. Then the other one, not on my list until I saw who was writing this, because I'll be honest, not the biggest Steel fan. I respect him. I think he's a cool character. But then I saw who was writing this. So you got Steelworks issue number one out this week. Clayman is the cover artist. Uh, Alejandro Sanchez is, does another cover art. But writing this issue, Michael Dorn. Really? A.K.A. Worf from Star Trek. That's awesome. Which is all sorts of awesome. So reading this description of this on comicsology.com, uh, it says, and I quote, Forging the future. The metropolis of the future is here today. But can it survive a terrorist who's out to for revenge against its builder, John Henry Irons, A.K.A. Steel and his company, Steelworks? And who possesses secrets that could undo everything John has worked so hard to build? While John's professional life is firing on all cylinders, his personal life is even better, as his on-again, off-again relationship with Lana Lang might be back on permanently. Now he must decide whether it's time to give up being Steel once and for all, but does John even know who he would be without his superhero identity? How does the other Steel, John's niece, Natasha Irons, feel about his mom- momentous decision? And does any of that matter if Steelworks crumbles around him when he leaks, or excuse me, when he lacks the superpowers to fight back? Right on. Michael Dorn, the voice of Steel and Superman, the animated series, teams up with artist Sam Basiri uh, from Harley Quinn uh, Catwoman to bring you the next chapter of, the St- of Steel's saga in this not to be missed six issue miniseries. So this sounds all sorts of awesome. Definitely going to check that out. Yeah, this is definitely on my radar. Like yeah. everything they've been doing with the Superman line. I think deserves a lot more press than it's getting. Uh-huh. Like, I mean, we all know Superman, obviously 85 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's super, like, you don't really need to hype it up that much, but you think about it in comparison yep. to, like, Batman yep. and how much hype that gets. And you're like, it's almost like you can't escape when something's going on there. I mean, yeah. he, but Superman, the work they're doing right now in that line deserves to get more hype and more praise because right now, it, in, in my opinion, it's been, it's, been so good it, it's been the best in years mm-hmm. so i definitely want to check this book out when it comes out and then the two from marvel are both star wars related uh the first one being star wars issue number 35 from charles soul uh listen star wars it's charles soul you cannot go wrong yeah i was gonna say you don't need much there you don't, you don't need much a uh, description in this luke skywalker in the clues clues of dr kuata the would-be jedi's lightsaber is all but destroyed enter kyber crystal expert dr kuata only he can repair it but at what price Luke's life will hang in the balance, and only another Jedi can help him. Hmm. Uh, so that's going to be super interesting to read. Uh, the, the cover's got Luke, Vader, and uh, Yoda on the cover. So, well, you know there's going to be something with that. Speaking of Yoda and Vader, or at least the Clone Wars versions of them, uh, Star Wars Yoda issue number eight is the other one from Marvel i got to mention because this is from Mark Guggenheim. Cannot go wrong with him. Uh, This reads, Master and Apprentice, the Separatists' army has a new super weapon, the Megadroid. But can Yoda and Anakin Skywalker destroy an entire factory full of them? The events of this issue directly overlap with Star Wars Revelations. See See how it's all connected. Hmm. Uh, listen, this has been a fantastic series that admittedly was not on my radar because I'm like, it's Yoda. They're not going to go crazy. They're not going to go deep and reveal any sort of lore or backstory with Yoda. But no, they're doing some great work. And uh, and if you're looking for something that like isn't so serious and isn't so tied in that like you can just read for fun and, and have some and have some fun reading, definitely recommend the Yoda series. Yeah, definitely. The, I mean, the Star Wars stuff they do over at Marvel has just been yeah. top notch. Even like in the past, like I don't think I've ever read like a really bad run yeah, of no. comics with Star Wars. Like I think no. everybody's really taken that much seriousness to the property. Yeah, and they know with when you throw that name on something, it's it's yeah. got to connect like yeah. that. So, uh, my picks this week for Marvel. Like, let's keep it Spider Man. Uh, the actual Spider Man adject- adjective list title: Spider Man number nine, Dan Slott, Mark Bagley. Uh, like, listen, the series has been so good too. Like I say, uh, I am a big fan of it. I've talked about it a couple times on the uh, Patreon. It's one that just really for me is another classic throwback to Spider-Man kind of ties into across the Spider-Verse too. So definitely, well, I should say not the series, but right, just right, right. the overall theme. Like when you can really find something that represents the character, like their motivations and such like this, it's always a fun read. And especially like in comparison to what is going on in amazing Spider-Man right now. Like I'm not a fan of that book, but I'm not, you know, completely, you know, trashing it and, and that whole nonsense. You could hear our, our discussion about that last week. I'm not going to get into it again. But this one is definitely one to keep an eye out for. Also, Marvel, Captain America, Sentinel of Liberty, number 13. 
And obviously, they're in the middle of the Cold War crossover the event that's going on there. Mm-hmm. And there was some uh, Captain America news announced that they're going to be having a new series come out in September. Okay. With JMS writing. Ooh. So, J. Okay. Michael Straczynski there. Um, dude, I am really, really excited to hear about that. Like, I, I had to do a legit double take. Right. Because, I mean, JMS has always done great work. Um, his Spider-Man, um, before One New Day, uh, some of, some of my favorite stuff. Yeah. Um, obviously One New Day and anything involving <laughs> that, I don't have anything nice to say about, so I, I keep it to myself. Uh, we can't even put that behind a Patreon. No, we can't. One of these days, somebody's going to catch me on that. I'm going to be, it's probably some real trouble, but, um. Uh, if anyone wants his opinion, if you see kind of New York Comic Con where he can't run or go anywhere, ask him then. Yeah, just. Make sure the phones are off. I don't want to be recorded. <laughs> I want to make sure about this because, like, trust me, it's like between that and, and my my stance on Ben Riley. Yeah, that that one. I don't know if I can even do behind a paywall, but yeah, I'm definitely excited to see about when JMS takes over writing Captain America in September. Like I say, Jesus uh, Sayas is going to be doing the artwork too, coming straight off the Punisher series, which just wrapped up. Which that is just bananas too, as well. But um, you know, like I say, the current run of Captain America has been really, really solid too. Yeah. So if you haven't yeah, checked that out, if you haven't checked that out, I give that a very, very high recommendation as well too. And like I say, the DC side of things, that Steelworks one is really jumping at me. Uh, I know Flash 800 just came out too. As mm-hmm. you know, is really going to be something as well too. Like everything they're doing at DC, just to give a, a very super quick plug about the dawn of DC stuff has been on point. And I don't think I've read anything I, I don't really dislike. I mean, there's some things I really like more than others, but I think everything has been pretty much that quo on point for me. So definitely want to say give that one a recommendation. Uh, and then going to my picks, uh, tell you what, Boom Studios has a, a real cool series coming out. Fence Redemption number one. So this is the continuation of the Glad Media Award-nominated sports comic. From uh, C. S. Packet oh. and Joanna the Mad, so it's a it's a fun story. Like I say, so far, um, this is the first time I picked it up, so I'm kind of used to the characters. But I thought it was very interesting. Uh, it's just about like a, a, a prep school for fencing, and they they have some really interesting characters that are going to be playing out here, and how it sets up things. Um, I'm definitely interested interested for it. So it's four issues. So I really want to see how this plays out. That's from our friends over at Boom Studios. Image Comics had a monster week this week, too. Uh, first on my list from them, Phantom Road number four, Jeff Lemire, Gabriel Walta. The mystery going on here from the truck drive uh, <laughs> nightmare that Dom and Bertie are going through continues on. It's now escalating. There's a lot of moving parts happening with the series. Last issue, I they were spending a lot of time on Agent Weaver. This time, they're, get, they're bringing everybody back together, and it slowly looks like they're tying all roads together. So this is one, Pat, I don't know if you're going to read a lot because they do have like some horror supernatural elements to it a little bit. Probably not. But it's more conspiracy theory than anything. But I could, but I understand when it first came out, I kind of threw some people for a loop because you have creatures like this. I'm just going to show Pat. Uh, what the fuck? Well, it's, it's the faceless creatures that they face when they go into the different timeline. Like I say, you have to read the series to get it, but I'm telling you what, it's very sharp writing. It's solid artwork. I definitely highly recommend it. Um, gave it a 8.5 out of 10 this week. Then we're talking image, Noctera, Scott Snyder, Tony Daniel. Uh, the series has really kicked into some gears with this current uh, story arc entitled No Breaks. This is the penultimate issue for that story arc. So a lot of things are coming into play. If you've been reading Noctera since day one, I picked it up on the Kickstarter. So I have been reading. I just had to go catch back up about this because I didn't I've just been falling behind on stuff. I get so many comics sent to me. It's just I'm and it's a gift and a curse. I just some things fall through the cracks. But I finally got a chance to dive back into Noctera this week. Solid issue. Really have a lot of stuff going on and especially heading into a special issue that is coming out next month with Liam Sharp drawing. I definitely want to check that out and especially going into the end of the no breaks arc. So a lot of solid stuff here. Nine out of ten on my scale about this. I really enjoyed this issue and just it's paying off for a lot of stuff they've been setting up for. So definitely want to recommend that. Also, there's a brand new book out by John Lehman, who you might know from Chew. Okay. And Joke. Uh, and this one is a story that when I first heard it, I was like, okay, what is this going to be about? And I'm just going to show pad one image with no context. 
Oh, what the fuck? Okay. This is called In Hell We Fight. And it is a story of some teenagers that are deceased Mm -hmm. that are now in hell um, and for various reasons. And when they plot a plan to go acquire some ice cream, things go awry really quick. And now they have stumbled into a conspiracy that I don't think they were even ready for. Probably not. But this is one story that I thought was a, like a surprise to me because this is more like fairy tale meets dark twisted fantasy. And this is one that is definitely going to have some people talking. Uh, very solid art. And like I say, just some of the imagery you read here, you're going to be like, what is this? Like, what is going on? But the story definitely picks up a lot of steam as a, as when you get all the major players together. And to see what they stumble upon, like I say, the final page is going to have a lot of people talking about this one. 8.5 out of 10 for me on this one. Definitely enjoyed it. And if you're looking for something else to check out at the comic shops, I definitely recommend that. Also, cannot leave without saying Inferno Girl Red Volume 1 is out on trade paperback. So definitely, if you want to get that volume put together, and I know you do, Massive Verse story has been absolutely phenomenal read, and you get it all in one chapter. So Matt Groom, Erica Durso, and the team over there did an amazing job with that. And stay tuned. We'll be talking a little more about Inferno Girl Red in the upcoming weeks. Dot, dot, dot. So as we like to end every entertainment edition, make sure you're going out and supporting your local comic shops wherever you're at. And make sure to go support your favorite comic independent podcast as well, too. Shout out to our guy, Brian Wayne. Cheers to comics. Got a lot of big things coming. That's what I hear. And I am not privy to this, but I will always say for our family out there, we, and Brian is part of our team, dude, I cannot wait to hear the big announcement. So I know he'll be listening to this. I'll probably get a quick thumbs up emoji sent to me, but... I definitely I want to shout him out because he's got something big lined up, and I'm so happy for him with what he's got coming up. So that being said, for anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's all we got for this week. So for the one, Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. See you next time.